Good morning. Do you all have, I know you have your bulletins and you're looking at your lyrics, but is, if you have a Black Faith We Sing book near you or if you can hand those around to people so everybody can grab one. And if you can turn to 2190, we're going to do a little bit of a new song this morning. So I thought we'd have a little, little practice session on it so that when we get there in the service, you can all sing along and feel comfortable and confident. Now I do sound a little, a little yucked up this morning. I will, I will guarantee you, because I have taken multiple of the tests, and I'm, I'm not COVID, but I've got, I, this is proof to all of us that we still get our normal crud. And this is my normal, school is going to start on Wednesday, so this is how I typically start school every year with my allergies, and par for the course, and stress, par for the course, this is me starting school. So, 2190, this is a song called Bring Forth the Kingdom. And this handsome man standing next to me, because you don't want to hear me sing this morning, is going to lead you through a little prayer. Uh, here we go. I'm going to play a little intro for you. Thank We're you. not going to get that PSP. 
Not that fancy today. That's fine. All right, we are close approaching the end of our capital campaign. This Sunday and next Sunday are the last two Sundays uh, to, to give or pledge towards the uh, we'll, we'll continue to accept contributions through the end of the year, but we're asking that if you want the matching grant, that you either give or pledge by August 31st. Uh, after worship today, the youth and their parents will be uh, meeting our new youth director and talking about programming for uh, the fall. Uh, so if you are in grades 5, or going into grades 5 through 12, Steph has some plans for you today. So go upstairs to the youth room, and uh, she's got some things upstairs for you. If uh, you're watching on Facebook, you weren't able to be with us, you can email or call Steph this week and get an update on all the plans. Um, next Sunday, we are hoping to be in the park. It feels like our plan has been to be in the park all summer long, right? And, and it, we did it up here more often than <laughs> um, But also we have our concert next week, so I need everybody's help. Even if it takes prayer and fasting, we need a dry Sunday next week. Uh, it, we're working on backup plans, but right now those are still too amorphous to say anything about. So. Uh, pray that we have dry weather so that we can be in the park for our concert. Um, and that, that's Terry Patrick Clark and the Galbraith Plan uh, and uh, uh, Tropical Freeze. Tropical Freeze is our food truck. And they will be here at, at around probably 4.30, maybe even a little bit before that. So come early so you can start to get your food and you can eat and the concert then will begin around 5 o'clock yep. with the Galbraith. So. All right. Uh, some other upcoming dates for you. I hope you've signed up for one of the two town halls or both that we are going to be having on September 7th or the 11th. You can RSVP through your connection card or by calling or emailing the church office. Sunday, September 11th, we're also going to be celebrating Grandparents Day. Kendra, did you want to say a few things about that or just say we're having Grandparents Day and check your newsletter? There will be flyers next week. Flyers next week. So Grandparents Day, September 11th, that's two weeks from three weeks from today, uh, and we're also going to be uh, having a, a, a service uh, commemorating, uh, remembering, uh, sorry, uh, the 9 11 uh, attacks. So uh, be, be ready for that on September 11th. And then it's September 18th, the next Sunday is Back to Church Sunday and our fall programming kickoff uh, celebration. So please remember to invite someone to worship. Uh, to back to worship, someone who may have not been uh, with us throughout the summer, uh, or someone who hasn't ever been to church anywhere. Uh, back to Church Sunday is the no excuse Sunday for you to start attending worship uh, in church. So we, we pray that uh, we can all be bold enough to invite at least one person back to church. With that, I'd like to invite Carla up to get us started with the focus scripture and opening prayer. Carla? Focus scripture today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 through 9. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters have, waters have a common purpose, and each will receive wages according to the labor of each. For we are God's servants, working together with you are God's skills, God's building. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for your great love and blessing over our lives. Thank you that your favor has no end, but it lasts for an eternity lifetime. We ask for your guidance so that we might walk fully in your blessing and goodness today. We pray that you may you make our ways beautiful <coughs> and our footsteps firm out of your goodness and love. Give us a heart of wisdom to hear your voice and make us strong by your favor and grace. In Jesus' name we pray. I invite you to stand as you're able and join together in our singing opening song of praise.
almost taken my pen. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I shall return it. Oh, this is a nice one. <laughs> I will return it. Are there joys and concerns to share this morning? School starts Wednesday. <laughs> School starts Wednesday. <laughs> I hear, I hear joy and concern. School starts Wednesday. <laughs> I think yours was the best. <laughs> School starts on Wednesday. Um, so we, we lift up students, we lift up teachers and administrators. Uh, for those of you who were able to join us, the uh, prayer walk last Wednesday here at Archville School, uh, the previous Thursday, uh, uh, a week more than a week ago, um, were great experiences to just walk through and, and bless the, the buildings and pray for uh, the teachers. I, I, as I was setting up for the art school prayer walks, I was doing it through the school day, uh, through their work day, and the teachers were there. And I thought, okay, I'm going to do it real quick in the, out of each building, about 20 minutes. It'll take me about an hour and a half. It took me three hours because I got stopped by different teachers who, who wanted to give their thanks that we are doing this, that we are we're doing prayer walks through the school to bless the building, to bless them, bless the students, but also to lift them up during the year. So continue to be in prayer for them. Other joys and concerns this morning? Ken? The men's group Wednesday morning had a real praise. We were joined by Coach Krause. Yeah, so I was back with men, the men's group. So he's probably online. Uh, may not have checked in yet. I don't see him there, but uh, he usually watches this online at the moment. And, uh, and it was praise that he was able to get out, and he, he's starting to venture out a little bit more and continue to lift him up after his transplant. He's doing well, isn't he? Seems to be. Yes, We're going to travel down to, to Grandma's for a quick overnight. Uh, Uncle Chris's birthday is was uh, last, week. last week sometime, I think Thursday. Uh, and so this is, uh, we're having a party for him. For our concerns for uh, Chuck Lugdale's family, Chuck passed away. Yes, yeah, what's up the Lugdale family? Uh, with Chuck's passing. <coughs> Landon. Uh, you're not going to be gone long enough to miss people. <laughs> we'll be right back tomorrow. For our first day. Yeah. Oh. I have a cousin, Sally. She is in the hospital on a ventilator, unresponsive, but she's a full code. And her family doesn't, the doctors are pushing them to make a decision. But it's very difficult for them. Friend, a friend, uh, Sally, is on a ventilator. No, my house. cousin Sally oh, is cousin. on the vent, and her brother and sister in law are the ones having to make a decision. Okay. Your cousin Sally's on the vent. Mm -hmm. So we lift up her and the family. Um, there are a few folks who are um, worshiping with us online and, and going through quarantine and things like that. So uh, pray for them as they're, they're feeling better, uh, but, but still still following following the best best rules. So if you, if you, if you uh, tested positive, go ahead and keep, keep back even if you're starting to feel better. All right, just checking one more time. Okay. So I know several people, and <laughs> I'm sure everybody does, but along with the back to school idea, there's kids that are going away from home, maybe for the first time, you know, to college and stuff. So I know we tend to think like back to school is, oh, the kids aren't going to be home, they're going to be going every day, you know, but some, for some families, this is a big change, you know. And I think I even know somebody that's 
their daughter has left to travel to study abroad, and so they're <laughs> halfway across the world. You know, so just remembering those people too as they yep. have those challenges. <coughs> Not, not, to, not to forget our college students that, are, that might be traveling much further uh, for their education. Let's quiet our hearts as we go to God in prayer. <laughs> Faithful God, you care for us with compassion and with firmness. You urge us to grow in love for you and each other and to become more like your Son, Christ, our Savior. And so we come to you this morning and we offer ourselves to you in praise and worship. We set aside this time, not as the only time to worship, it is the time that we gather together as brothers and sisters that we might grow together and we might encourage one another. And as we come together, we share our joys and concerns. We are thankful, Lord, for the start of a work that has gone into this, the preparation pray for the anxieties to be calmed, for the nerves to be stilled, that this year would be a year. We give thanks for uh, Doug's continued health and recuperation and that he was able to join with others as they support each other in this walk. We offer prayers for the Lugville family. And as we remember Chuck, we give you thanks for his witness in our community. Pray, Lord, that you would be with those who mourn him most. Be with Sally, Lord. Touch her body. Give her comfort. Give the family the discernment and peace they need for whatever decisions need to be made. God, we trust you because you are steady and firm. You're something for us to hold on to. Teach us how to walk in your way, how to live your truth. Root us in you alone. Help us to grow in grace and love that we may fulfill our role and work in the reign of Jesus Christ, even as we pray, as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, and the glory forever.
is met the hardest. When I met the man in this way, weeds, we're all born weeds, full of sinful nature and strife. We just ugly weeds. Is your life a weed or a flower? Are you growing straight or growing wild? Do you have your roots in the kingdom? Or are you still a prince of darkness child? Weeds for all born weeds, full of sinful nature and strife. Get different teachers. You get to go get new stuff, right? 
You get like a, maybe a new backpack or new folders. You don't do that. School clothes. No? This is what happened when I went to school. So <laughs> you can't sleep in. Right. So that's nice to sleep in, but you don't get to do that. You have to get up. What what else other than changes at school? What else happens this time of year that changes? No. <laughs> what else changes? This is fall, right? What changes are we going to see in fall? And I'm going to get my mark. Yes, you're going to change to a year older. <laughs> the leaves are going to fall down. That was a tough one. <laughs> Yeah, they change colors first, and then they fall down. Anything else? Nothing else changes? What? Oh, you get to go to your school? Yeah, that's a good idea. That's definitely a good change. Do you get to wear different clothes? Because it won't be so hot anymore eventually, right? Like, it'll start to be not so hot, so you'll have to get a jacket. Then you'll have to get like a winter coat. That's a bad part of it. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm having to wear a coat. There's changes going on here, right? So we have changes up in the sanctuary. It's going to be totally new. They're making it new. Neat, huh? <laughs> Some changes are very exciting, like that, right? So with all of this stuff changing, and all new things happening, sometimes it can be a little sad. You get to go to junior church. <laughs> but sometimes changes are fun, and you might be excited about a new change. But what we can hold fast to, like we can hold tight onto and trust, is that Jesus never changes. The way you, the stories that we read in the Bible, the things we read in the Bible about Jesus are the same then, but they're still the same now. He still is someone who can comfort us, someone we can trust. He's still someone who listens and loves he never changes. I'm going to sing like a little song. It's really short. And then I want you to sing it with me. It's really easy. Okay. And you guys know it. So that'll help. But okay. So Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. That's like the Bible verse I was going to share. So it's much more fun to sing it than to say it. Okay, so let's sing it. You can do it with me. You ready? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Okay, we're going to pray and then you get to go to church. <laughs> yeah, over there. You repeat after me. Dear God, we are thankful for Jesus, and that he never changes. In your name, amen.
to read today is from Matthew 13, verses 24 to 30 and 36 through 43. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seeds in his field. While everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat, and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seeds in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered. An enemy has done this, the slave said to him. Then do you want then you want us to go gather them? But he replied, No. For in gathering the weeds you will upward the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. At the harvest time I will tell the fruit of the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be Gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. Disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds, the weeds in the field. He answered, The good one who sows the, the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is, a, is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are, just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be, so will it be, so will it out of this kingdom all causes of sin and all evil doers. And they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where they will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the, right, the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father, but anyone with ears will listen. This is the word of the Lord. one announcement. Uh, we are currently just about $150 shy of $93,000 in our uh, capital campaign, <coughs> which is more than double what we had originally said, so I <coughs> forgot to mention that earlier. Um, I wanted to let you all know. All right, so it seems that there is a common facet of American life. I can ask this question, and everybody is going to know the answer to it. When you want to be in polite company, there are two topics that are off the table. What are they? Wow, you guys said it the right way. It's just easy. You guys know it. Growing up, I learned in my family at the Sharp Family Reunion that politics and religion were off the table for the entire weekend. From 6 p.m. on Friday until noon on Sunday. We didn't talk about politics or religion. In my family, there are Mormons, which is why we have really excellent genealogy research going back to the 1400s. Catholics, and a heaping helping of Protestants from various traditions. When you have 500 people in your family, it's kind of hard not to have a variety. We have people on both sides of the political spectrum. But when you get to the homestead, on top of the mountain outside of Marlington, West Virginia, really close to Ed Ray, politics and religion are a no-go. You don't divide the family. Don't talk about it. This works for the reunion. Yet as soon as people get on Facebook, even in the family, it's like a switch that flips on and off, and the two sides come out for fights. And frankly, while all the finer points of doctrine are off the table at the Shark Family Reunion, we still gather around the front porch of my great-grandmother's house so that she can come out with her walker and sit on the porch swing, and we all sing hymns together mm -hmm. on Sunday morning. Jesus wants us to talk about matters of faith with others. There is a right and a winsome way to do so, and there is a very, very wrong way to talk about faith. For that matter, politics, the body public, is supposed to be talked about in public. We've suppressed the discussion so much with one another that we have forgotten how to do so right in our society to talk about either politics or religion. We've lost that ability for lack of effort. And so anytime we start to talk about it, it comes out as vitriol and spitefulness. 
I believe it's possible to talk about politics and religion in a polite way, in polite company. We just have to build on relationship first, and not the issues. I'm sure you're all well aware that something is up in the United Methodist Church. And it's been going on for many, many years. Longer than I have been here in Archibald, longer than I've served as a pastor in my life, Longer than I've been attending United Methodist Church. In fact, it's been longer than I have been alive. Several months back, the leadership team and the staff parish relations committee met together jointly to hear the latest information of what was going on in the wider church. Now, if you know my leadership style, you know that I love to start a meeting with a devotion. If I, if I have time to prepare something, I will, but at the very least, we're going to pray. We're going to start with prayer because that's our first reason for being together is the worship of God in Christ. And so the work that comes after that is worshipful work. So if I try, if I if I have time, I try to prepare something. And that night when the leadership <coughs> team met with the SBRC back in April, I shared with you, I shared with them the passage that you heard this morning. And I recounted one of the most formative moments that I've had with that passage while I was in seminary. I took a class, uh, oddly enough, that was the Gospel of Matthew. Um, and we spent four class sessions, two weeks, on just Matthew chapter 13. Because there's a lot to unpack there in those parables. When it came to the parable of the wheat and the weeds, my professor paused. And I, I recall him sitting down, and, and the tone of his voice changed. He got really serious, and I, I feel like it was from personal experience, but I, it could have also been from vicarious experience as well. Yet he knew the gravity of the subject he was talking about when he spoke to us. There are controversies in the church. <laughs> And it's not just in the United Methodist Church. And by the way, he wasn't a United Methodist. He reminded us, people are going to disagree. It's the nature of human beings. He was emphatic. People always disagree. The way I like to share it is when there's two people who walk into a room, there's going to be three opinions. The first person's opinion, the second person's opinion, and their joint opinion if they can come to an agreement. They can't come to an agreement. They just have a debate. That never ends. When the debate is on two mutually exclusive ideas, like the current debate in the United Methodist Church, you'll have a lot of tension to live with in order to stay together. And this parable offers a kind of lens that we look at that debate. My professor said, you're always going to have weeds among the wheat. No matter what you do or what you try, there will always be weeds among the wheat. There's always going to be someone or some group that will be different than you. Let this be the first lesson. You might be the weed in someone else's wheat. The plants that the workers in the field saw when they first started growing looked exactly the same. Those weeds and weeds uh, that Jesus is specifically talking about in this parable, when they first sprout up, they both look exactly the same. There's no difference between them until it's too late. The wheat is starting to be in kernel. And then the weeds show their characteristics as weeds. And by then, the weeds' roots are fully entangled among the wheat. To remove them would damage the wheat. You pull them out before it was time. Of course, the weeds are going to hurt the yield of the crop a little bit, but it would hurt the crop even more if you pulled out the weeds. So the master wisely says, Leave it until harvest time. 
At harvest time, you can toss the weeds and the wheat you can bring into the barn. And Jesus shares this parable to remind the disciples there's always going to be controversy in the church. You're not going to be able to weed out everything and have a perfect field. And here's the thing. Disagreement within the church has been a thing since, well, Peter baptized Cornelius. Or Paul and Barnabas couldn't decide where to go on their second road trip together. Or who to bring along. Some people can live with that kind of tension. Some people can work within the parameters of a side agreement. We disagree on this thing right here, but we agree on this over here. And so we'll focus on this. Not talk about this. That's how most ecumenical agreements in the church work. The, the Archbold Area Ministers Association has an agreement on the things that are common to us as Christians and how we will behave as a group with each other within that framework when we come together. We agree to it. We don't talk about our squabbles of doctrine between the Lutherans and the Methodists and the Mennonites and the Catholics and the Baptists. We don't do that. Because we agree on this over here. And that's what we work towards. And that can work. As long as everyone keeps the covenant with one another. And initially that tension in that covenant within the United Methodist Church worked well. 50 years ago, it was working fine. But it became increasingly problematic. The covenant has been broken by more than one side, time and again. Each side has attempted to toss out what they considered the weeds. And in the end, they hurt the crop. They hurt the church. The only options are to change the terms of the covenant. To change the terms of this agreement, either to continue in a different fashion, such as was done in Acts chapters 9 through 11 when Peter baptized Cornelius, the, the church said, Well, Gentiles can't come into the church. That's amazing. We never thought of that before. Or they can bless each other and go separate ways, like Paul and Barnabas did at the end of Acts chapter 15. Both are healthy choices. Scripture tells us that and shows us that. The church grew after both events. Yet there is one thing that is not healthy. One thing that you cannot do, if the tension only increase and increases and continues to harm everyone, you cannot keep fighting. When such deeply held and sincere opinions exist, if the two sides can't come to live within covenant with each other again, or under a different term of covenant, then it's time to part. For many years, the question has been, is it harvest time in the United Methodist Church? Is that a Paul and Barnabas moment happening? Now, this isn't the end time part. That's, that's, that's the ultimate talk in the passage today. There's always going to be disagreements. In the expressions of faith that are going to come out of whatever is happening in the United Methodist Church on both sides or all the splits that occur, there's still going to be wheat and there's still going to be weeds in all of those. No matter what decision this congregation makes on the topic, there's going to be matters of debate even moving into our future. For instance, I know that there are a few people who are not happy about the changes and renovations that are being made. They didn't support it. Now I know others of you that are ecstatic about it. And that's okay. In the future, we'll likely have debates on the next project. Have you thought about the next project yet? <laughs> Could be the fellowship hall. Could be the education wing. Should we repair the blacktop that's outside over there? That's going to be a pretty penny right now. Should we build a family life center? That's a mint there. Should we do it all? Perhaps. There's going to be opinions on that. There's going to be a decision one way or the other. And things will continue. 
The question is, can we live and work together for the mission of the gospel? I know it's silly, but churches have split over small things like the color of the carpet that they're putting in. It's happened. There will always be weeds among the weeds. The question is, are you going to continue in mission together or not? If you can't figure out a way to do it, then you should bless each other and move on. The United Methodist Church seems to have entered in a kind of harvest phase. The last 50 years, two sides have lived together in a covenant and are no longer able to remain faithful to the competing visions that they have for what that covenant leads to. And it's come to a point where they're deciding to split. So like Paul and Barnabas, instead of fighting about it and continuing to hurt each other and losing sight of the mission, the two sides truly need to bless each other. At this moment in time, there will be a side that will remain United Methodist and may envision a, a more progressive theology and a centralized structure that works together to serve others in Christ's name. The side that's choosing to leave may envision a more traditional theology and a structure that focuses on the ministries of the local church so that they can make disciples of Jesus Christ. There is still a great deal of similarity between the two of them. It's striking how similar the two are. Yet the nuance of the disagreement that exists is the same kind of nuance that existed between Paul and Barnabas. I cannot tell you the ultimate percentage of the breakdown of the connection, how it's going to end up. Some will stay and want to stay. Some will stay because they feel like they can't afford to go. And others will want to go. In my view, both sides have wheat that will be collected into the storehouses. And both sides will have weeds that will be tossed into the fire. The question ultimately is not, how can we pull out all the weeds? That's not our job. The question is, how do we tend the garden? How do we tend the garden? The, while the laborers are focused in the parable on the weeds, the master is focused on the garden, on the harvest. The parable makes the point that the master's concern is the wheat, and at the harvest, the weeds will be taken care of by those who are assigned to take care of the weeds. Until then, the laborers are to be in the field doing their job tending the weeds and ignoring the weeds until the appropriate time. As we enter into a period of discernment, I want to encourage you all this morning. Turn your attention away. Don't look at the presenting issue of human sexuality that gets into the weeds and focus on the main question of the parable. How can we be faithful in tending the garden? How can we be faithful in tending the garden that God has given us, Archbold, Ohio, this community, to reach out, to lead others towards Christ? There are going to be some people who will answer that question differently than the way you'll answer that question. You've worshipped with them for 10, 20, 30 years, 40, 50 they're going to answer it differently. Some of them will say the best way to do this is to stay. Some will say the best way to do this is to go. We have an opportunity to look at the master and ask the question, which is your vision for our future? What do you see us doing? Both sides are going to continue to have wheat and weeds in the United Methodist Church. The question is, how is God calling this congregation to tend our garden, Archbold, Ohio, that we serve in Christ's name, that we proclaim the gospel to each and every day? I was asked to share this passage that was shared at that meeting, and my prayer is that you hear the message of the Master. Focus on the weeds. And I hope that I have not persuaded you one way or the other, because that was not my intent this morning. 
because it's about how God is calling you into the future so that you can focus <coughs> on the harvest. Let God persuade you. One way or the other. The choice before you is a different vision for how to tend the garden. There's going to be a separation, a split, a splinter in the United Methodist Church. It's already happening. You can't change reality. I wish it could. The message today is to keep the main thing the main thing. Focus on tending the garden and discern the way that God intends for this congregation to tend the garden and leave the weeds alone. Let's pray. Master, we look out over the wider church and see many on both sides who have spent much energy pulling at weeds and hurting the weeds. Help us, Lord, to keep our focus on you and all that we do. As we discern the direction you would have us to go together, offer us your grace and mercy. Guide and direct us. Help us to tend to the garden that others might be called into your salvation. And keep us from focusing on the deeds. Amen. I invite you to stand as you're able as we sing our closing song. Come, ye thankful people, come, raise the song of Harvest Home, number 694, and also printed in your